Hey, I'm Josh Rushing, sitting in for Fit Me OK today, and you are in the stream. Canada's Inuit are hunting for survival. Do they have to abandon their culture to ease the pains of poverty in a warming Arctic? Our digital producer Malika Bilal is here and is our bridge to the digital community. Mm -hmm. This one actually kind of started with the digital community, right? It did. And we love when that happens. It started with a campaign called the Seal Fee Campaign. And yes, you heard that right. The Seal Fee Campaign started in response to U.S. talk show host Ellen DeGeneres. We wrote about it on our website here. It was after her recent $1.5 million donation to an anti-seal hunting organization. So in a video entitled Dear Ellen, 17-year-old Kilak Inarak Strauss explained what the seal hunt means to her community. You can have a listen to that here. Yeah, I own sealskin boots and they are super cute and I am proud to say that I own them. But I also eat seal meat more times than I can count. And I just, I can't apologize for that because it's... Even now that we've been assimilated into a Western society, traditional food is still the thing that is sustaining families who cannot afford to go to the grocery store. Because Those are her words. We want to hear yours. Tweet us with hashtag AJStream. Yeah, thanks, Malika. You can follow today's chat on Twitter with the hashtag Silfie. And if you've got something else on your mind, we'll, we'll be on the lookout for trending hashtags like these. The Sylvie campaign began as a playful response to criticism of the Inuit's traditional seal hunt. But it's revealed a grave truth. The Inuit are going hungry and many rely on hunting to survive. Inuit children are regularly skipping meals. And a new report shows that the territory of Nunavut has the highest rate of food insecurity of any indigenous community in the developed world. Climate change is a part of the problem. Warming temperatures are making it harder to hunt food to eat and sell. And the pressures of poverty, a history of abuse, and a clash of cultures between Canada's North and South have created a mental health nightmare. The suicide rates among Inuit youth are among the highest in the world. So do Canada's Inuit have to assimilate to the Southern way of life to survive? With us to discuss in Ottawa is Ayu Peter, Inuit activist and recipient of Canada's highest honor, the Order of Canada, for her promotion of Inuit culture. In Rankin Nunavut, Gabriel Nurlungakyuk the director of wildlife for Nunavut Tungavik Inc. In Montreal, Alethea Arnacook Burrill, filmmaker and Inuit activist. And in Ottawa, Jack Hicks, instructor of child studies at Carleton University. Uh, are you, have you seen the Sylphie campaign? What, what did you think about it? Yes, I have. And I was very proud of Kilak's response to Ellen. I'm very proud of the Inuit that have come out in large numbers and posted their garments and their pride in in wearing seal. Mm. Can you tell us what seals mean and, and hunting seal means for your community? I think seal has been the main uh, food that made us survive in the Arctic. The thing is we can hunt the seal year round and the seal skin is used for clothing, but the seal meat and the seal fat is used for food and for the lamb. So we really depended on seal for everything in, in the Arctic. And today, we still need the seal meat. It is nutritious, and we share it with the community, and we ensure that people that are going hungry are getting nutritious, healthy food. Are you, I know you do a bit of fashion design with uh, seal. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're wearing right now? This one I made, um, this is like the Amoti style where the woman puts the baby in the hood 
mm. here, mm -hmm. and this uh, this one is made in the contemporary style, so that I can wear it uh, inside and to meetings. But it's uh, dyed seal skin, dyed in green, and then part of it, like here, is natural seal skin. Well, Gabriel, I want to go to you with these uh, two tweets that we received from our community members. This is from Vic Victor, and he speaks of the seal fee campaign, as it's called. He says that hashtag exemplifies the tension between the Inuit and Arctic people and some Southerners. Uh, it's a lack of understanding about the seal hunt. Uh, another person goes on to say, JJ on Twitter, it would be racially insensitive to cry foul on the seal hunt, as many do. It's a means of survival. So, Gabriel, can you explain a little bit about more for our audience who may not understand why this is a means for survival. And in fact, you're a hunter and, and you told our producer ahead of the show, you're going hunting this week, correct? Yeah, um, well, over uh, many thousands of years, uh, Inuit, uh, that uh, we live in a very harsh environment uh, up to today. Um, and they hunted uh, in order to survive uh, for lighting up their kulik, uh, eating eating the seal meat uh, and sharing um, when a hunter uh, finally catches a seal, you know, giving thanks to the, the creator and, and, and I've, I've seen my grandmother uh, well, even though the, the seal is dead um giving thanks to the to the seal she would give the water to the seal so that's what that's how much uh inuit have respect for the seal it's gonna uh sustain uh, life uh, sustain the the community and sustain the uh the family so um we they've hunted for survival over thousands of years and now today it's, it's very expensive up here as you may know um, for hunters to to in order to feed them it is very expensive uh, so uh, it's very important uh, for, to continue on the, the seal hunt and and offset some of the costs of uh, living up in Canadian Arctic. Hey Gabriel you were saying there's rough conditions up there can you, can you share with our audience where you are and what the weather is like right now? Well, I wake up to a balmy minus 25 this morning in Celsius, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's still very cold. If I'm out on the land, I would need uh, heat, and the best source is uh, seal meat, so uh, that will keep me warm for the day. How much are bullets now? Yeah, it depends. Uh, the bullets that I use uh, anywhere from 25 to $30 a, uh, a box, so it's it's very expensive. Yeah, so it's even expensive to hunt. I want to show the audience something I have on my computer. This is actually um, it's put up by the Globe and Mail, and it shows grocery prices around Nunavut compared to the rest of Canada. So to get a, a liter of milk in Nunavut, you would pay on average three dollars and nineteen cents, where the rest of Canada would pay two dollars and thirty cents uh, for bananas. Look at this: four dollars and thirty-one cents for bananas in Nunavut, and a dollar sixty-nine in the rest of Canada. That's like three times the cost. So it, it seems like if, if this is what you're having to pay for groceries, and it's throughout, it's oranges, it's bacon, it's, it's everything. And, it, and I've been in none of it. I've seen how expensive mm -hmm. the groceries are. I imagine that makes the hunting that much more important. And also when, when you hunt, what do you do with the meat when you come back? Do you freeze it and just feed your family or does it become a community affair? No, um, um, first of all, most I'm hunting for my family, but if I'm lucky enough, then I'll, I'll share it with extended family. And and for people that don't have uh, hunting uh, partners anymore, like o older f older folks, uh, they still want to eat what they used to eat when they uh, when they were growing up. So I would share that uh, the meat uh, as far as it can. So it's. It's very important. I see you alluded to earlier. It's, it's very expensive up here, and hunting is very crucial to offset uh, uh, the cost of living up here. Well, the the whole idea that going from living off of hunting to this more kind of southern or westernized version of buying food from a grocery store, 
The entire Inuit culture is just recently, really the last what, couple of generations come around to that. The, and it, it hasn't been an easy transition. I'd like to bring in Jack Hicks here. Can you talk to us about the social situation? And perhaps I know you're an expert in suicide. This is just one of the examples of what the Inuit community is going through. But if you could bring up what the suicide rate in places like Iqaluit are, are like and talk to us about the society as a whole. whole. New society is um, undergoing a great deal of stress. Mm. A lot of a lot of families are living in situations of stress from poverty, um, a lot of anger in a lot of in many households. Children growing up in that situation, um, it's a vibrant culture, to be sure, but it's a culture with a lot of trauma embedded in it, and a lot of stress from day-to-day -day living conditions. Last year, the overall suicide rate was 14 and a half times the national rate. And for young teenage uh, boys, it was 40 times. That's just one indicator of the overall level of stress, but it's the most dramatic and the most tragic indicator. Wait, Jack, your sound broke up just a little bit there. Did you say 14 times the national rate? 14 and a half for the society as a whole, 40 for 15 to 19 year old boys. Hmm. Well, Ayo, actually, we have a video comment here from uh, someone who has a question on this uh, quite alarming suicide rate. Have a listen to this. But I'm a big supporter for young Inuit in Inuit communities, and um, it's really tough on them for sure because you lose the people that you knew when you were uh, children, and growing up with them, losing them is really tough for sure, and you want to understand what's causing this issue and why people are doing it, and especially the people that you know. So Ayu, can you help us understand uh, the reasoning behind this? Um, I think we have gone through a process of colonization and there, it has become difficult where young people and the older generation are living in sort of two different worlds. The transition period where you have to be bilingual and bicultural has become very is stressful. You have to be 100% good in the Inuit culture and you have to be 100% good in the Western imposed culture and finding your way as a young person is hard enough to start with but when you're um, bombarded with these two different cultures um, it becomes hard. It is very hard for our youth to go through this process and hard for everyone in Nunavut. We know everybody all the families know everybody, so every time there's a suicide, everybody is touched. And it has to be addressed right now. Alethea, uh, I know you live down in, in Montreal, right? No, I live in Iqaluit. I just happen to be in Montreal right now. Oh, you just happen to be in Montreal? Yeah. What is the, the process of assimilation like for someone of your generation? It's... Um it's complicated. I mean, we're always we're always walking a fine line. We're trying always trying to balance the two cultures. Myself, I'm uh, a mix of uh, Inuk. My mom's uh, Inuit, and my father is um, is from uh, Quebec. So, even as individuals, <laughs> sometimes we're literally uh, half and a half. Um, but even those who are full-blooded Inuit in the Arctic are still trying to deal with learning how to ba how to balance both cultures. And there are so many factors that contributed to the to the suicide rates today. Um, you could go on and on about it. You can dedicate an entire show to it and still not really understand how it could be so bad. Um, but there there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's hope. There there are indicators of uh, what needs to be done in order to bring in this staggering suicide rate. I was uh, in the community of Clyde River once working on a film um, and coming from Iqaluit, I see so many of our young men, our teenage boys walking around with you know, their, their hoods on and kind of their, even their body language um, is kind of shut, shut down and shutting the world out. Mm -hmm. And I was in Clyde River and there was a group of young men who traveled by snowmobile from Igrulik to Clyde River, which is, I mean, they were on the land for a few weeks hunting along the way. And this group of young men came into this community, they arrived, and I just 
it still gives a lump in my throat to to talk about it. They stood there with clear eyes and a confidence that I had never seen in young men before growing up in Iqaluit. It was beautiful. It was um, it was so wonderful to see. And so to me, that really points to what we need to do as a society. Our young men, our young women need a strong sense of identity and a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And in the North, that means being part of a, a, a hunting culture. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, I know that uh, part of what you do is teach the next generation about wilderness survival and hunting. Uh, I'd like to ask you about that, but I'd also like to show you what people outside of Canada actually think about when you think about seal hunting. So if you look at my computer here, this is from the um, Humane Society. And it, it's an entire graphic, I'll scroll kind of slowly through it, about what they call the seal slaughter. Now this is from uh, the commercial seal slaughter, and it talks about uh, more than two million defenseless baby seals have been killed in Canada. It gets pretty graphic with uh, how they're killed. It, it really kind of goes through and says it's just about fashion at, at one point, but it, it never really makes an exception for Inuit. It never really shows, you know, what it means to your community. Gabriel, can can you address that a little bit, and can you address why it's so important? To, to teach what you teach to the next generation? Yes. Um, I mean, today in, in 2014, I mean, we've gone through dramatic changes, as everybody knows. Um, however, uh, if you don't know the, uh, the survival skills in order to, to go out hunting, I mean, uh, it, it's a bit warmer now, but it's you still could freeze out there, so you need survival skills to go out and uh, and hunt, and in order to provide for for your uh, family. So I I I try to teach uh, you know my son and whoever is is going out with me uh, because you know I'm not going to be out there uh, uh, with them forever. And this I've seen it with my with my dad and my grandfather teaching me the skills. Uh, learning uh, how to survive out there, uh, so it's it's very important for for Inuit men um, uh, to teach their you know their sons and whoever is out there with them, including women too. I mean, uh, when you go home, um, you you catch what whatever you catch seal or caribou, whatever uh, that can be turned into a garment and the the seals uh, and caribou are the warmest up here um, even up to today in, in technology in clothing it, it is the warmest so uh, th that's why you know, we're able to survive when uh, Sir John Franklin wasn't able to uh, with the best technology uh, of the 17th century um, it's still the the best warmest uh, clothing um, there is so both survival skill of uh, young young uh, young men uh, out there and and uh, the the gar making of garments like uh, are you uh, it has made is is very important you know you're talking about the the best warmest clothing there is two of our guests today are uh, wearing uh, a seal products and there's a tweet here um, from Claire she says that the larger market means more benefit larger market means more chance to sell finished product for designers and seamstresses and so that's the problem that this person has with what y you pulled up uh, mm -hmm. Josh from the Humane Society about um, uh, the seal hunt now of course the Humane Society tweeted us I have this tweet here on the distinction between commercial hunt and subsistence seal hunting. They say there is a difference. We also got a video comment um, from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. I'd like all of our guests to have a listen to this. Hi, my name is Cheryl Fink. I'm the Director of Canadian Wildlife Campaigns for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. IFA does not oppose subsistence hunting of seals by Inuit as a source of food. We recognize that food security is very important. Our campaigns are directed against the commercial slaughter of wildlife for international trade, whether it's elephants being killed for their tusks, rhinos for their horns, or seals for their skins. That is the sort of hunting that has shown to be unsustainable over the long term. Thanks for letting us make this clarification. 
So Alethea, several organizations talking about their clarifications, but what are your thoughts on this? And, and does that clarification really make a difference if in the minds of, let's say, those of us here in the state, we, heal, we hear about seal hunting, we think bad? Yeah, <laughs> please notice, she said, IFA is not against Inuit subsistence hunting. What she fails to say, and she knows this, and all of these animal groups know this, is that although Inuit hunt primarily for food, we eat the meat of every seal that is caught or feed our dogs with the, with the meat that is caught, but it's mostly for human consumption. However, we do also sell skins for commercial income. So there is a commercial aspect to the Inuit hunt, and this is what they fail to mention, that they're, the legislation that they uh, fought so hard to pass in Europe a few years ago, where they banned the sale of any seal skin product throughout all of their 27 countries. They failed to mention that this legislation absolutely harms uh, the ability of Inuit to sell our seal skins, and which therefore in turn affects our ability to hunt uh, and feed our families, because uh, money is necessary for hunting nowadays. It costs money for bullets, it costs money for gas and snowmobiles, and we need to be able to sell those skins in order to continue hunting. And when you reduce the amount of uh, hunting that's going on, that's less food on the table for Inuit. Gabriel, when you're working with the, the younger people there, do they want to know uh, about the hunting skills? And can you give us a sense from your perspective particularly when it comes to the issue of the suicide rate there. What's going on? No, um, like uh, I think you has uh, explained the uh, assimilation and, and, and cultural in, uh, of changing uh, to today. Um, I mean, it's still going to be, it's still going to, even with climate change, it's still going to get cold. The coldest here was minus 65 Celsius this winter, so that's cold. Uh, even today in April, uh, it's minus 20 out there, and it, that's, you still could freeze if you don't know the, the skill. So uh, with the youth, when they're out on the land, you know, they reconnect with the land of their ancestors of, you know, for millennia. So um, once they learn a skill, uh, whatever skill that is, e either you know, sh uh, hunting a seal, butchering a seal, cooking the seal, eating the seal, you're connecting with, you know, with your ancestors there. So that says a lot, and uh, that's one of the the, the skills that uh, hunters try to bring pass on to the to the younger folks, so that once they're able to uh, get out on their own, then they have the skills to survive out there. Jack, can you talk to us about what do you think are some of the driving factors of the suicide rate being so high, and how do you change it? How do you stop it? How do you address it? Well, research that we've done, Josh, uh, shows pretty clearly by following the lives of more than 100 people who died by suicide, uh, mainly young people. People die by suicide in Nunavut for the same reasons, same basket of reasons that people die by suicide in the South. People have problems in their personal lives, find themselves in a point of distress, and um, and uh, they snap. And that's why I never talk about Inuit suicide. I talk about suicide by Inuit because it's the same fundamental dynamic as suicide in any culture in the world. Jack, what can be Jack, what you're saying, it's incredibly important. Unfortunately, I have to cut you off here because we're going to end the live show uh, for just a few minutes. But I want our audience to go online, go to stream.aljazeera.com, where you can continue to follow in this discussion in our online post show. And on our next show, we turn to Turkey, where despite major corruption allegations and anti-government protests, the ruling AK party came out a winner in local elections. We'll discuss how that happened and what it means for upcoming presidential elections. Until then, we'll see you online.
All right, we're going to jump right back into the online post show here. We're talking about Canada's Inuit community and do they have to assimilate to survive? And as a host, I'm, at, I'm just kicking myself that I was so into the discussion, I lost track of time. And I, and I asked Jack Hicks, uh, who's one of our guests today, a really important question about what's driving the suicide rate. It's 14 and a half times the rest of Canada. And he was explaining that, but I also wanted to give him a chance to, to how it can be addressed. And I had to cut him off before he could get to the solutions. So for our online audience, I'm glad you're still with us. And Jack, I'm glad you're still with us as well. Can you talk to us about some of the solutions and the way to address this? Happy to, Josh. Um, there actually is a suicide prevention strategy that was developed for Nunavut. It was a joint project between MTI, the group that Gabriel works for, uh, the police, a multi-sectoral group called the Embrace Life Council, and the government. And um, it had two main focuses. One, uh, better and more appropriate services for youth and adults. And second, a major investment in the social-emotional well-being of children so that 15 to 20 years from now, young people are in a, have had a better start to life than is the case in many homes today. The tragedy is that the strategy has been largely un unimplemented, and the tragedy is also that the federal government is just looking the other way and has done nothing to help a region whose suicide rate is massively out of line with the rest of the country. If this was happening in Prince Edward Island or Saskatchewan or California, where Ellen is from, action would be taken. And it's, it's unconscionable that Inuit are being allowed to suffer in this way without um, assistance from the federal government. Are you, why do you think that is? Why do you think there seems to be a double standard on what the federal government will allow to happen with the Inuit population? Because uh, any member of the parliament is not going to lose a seat. We are only 32,000 people in Nunavut, and the Europeans and the Canadian governments, people that run for office know this, they're not going to win or lose a seat for it. I think it's deplorable. And could I please go back to the exemption and the um, uh, comment by Cheryl Fink? Mm -hmm. The, ex the exemption of the seal, seal ban, made, allowed the politicians, the parliamentarians, to go ahead and make a total ban. And they, they're always saying, well, you have an exemption, and we are not attacking the Inuit uh, culture, we are not attacking the Inuit economy. However, our ceiling is tied to the commercial ceiling. We depend on a good price for our seals. Since the import of the ban, for instance, in Greenland, export has dropped by 90%. There's 33% less hunters of seal. And out of those th left, they get 33 to 34% less income from the sale of seal skin. So you're speaking about suicide. You're speaking about uh, cultural assimilation. You're, we are speaking about uh, a, an economic colonization again. Um, you, you, you can count two plus two as four, it makes sense. We have to address the ceiling issue and we have to address the suicide rate. And, and looking for solutions, our community has a few ideas. On Twitter, Golden Eagle says, it's simple, give the people back their land, kill mining, oil, gas, and timber industry, give them back their way of life. Um, uh, but Gabriel, we're, there's also a tweet here, and this is just one of a few that I've seen today. Um, Miller writes in, this is a reflection of the Native Americans here in the US, who as a culture, he says, cannot adapt to a modern economic infrastructure. Gabriel, what do you say to people uh, when you hear this, that this is about not adapting to uh, modern society? Well, um being an Inuk, uh, I think we are very uh, adaptable. I mean, it's been uh, in my lifetime, anyhow, uh, growing up in an igloo, and now talking to you by uh, web uh, web base. Uh, so it, it it I think we're pretty adaptable. However, um, with the with other societies uh, not understanding all our culture and attacking our culture where I'll tell you a little story here when uh, marine mammal protection act came into uh, uh force by the United States uh, uh, in the 80s uh, my grandfather being a very 
uh, independent man uh, and all of a sudden couldn't sell his uh, seal skins and the prices dropped and then becoming uh, dependent on social services I've, I've seen a broken man and that times how many people now with the European Union uh, having this ban even though like Caillou is is correct that uh, even though we have an exemption it, it it's we really depend on the market so uh, you're putting a lot of independent uh, hunters to being very dependent on a social assistance I one of the things that struck me when I was in Nunavut is that it's like Gabriel said it, the breakneck speed at which culture is changing for this community. Mm -hmm. it, it's a generation or two really away from growing up in, in an igloo mm -hmm. to being in what's supposed to be a completely westernized society. And, and for a culture to be expected to change so fast, you know, the thousands of years of history, I, I, you, maybe you can speak to this, it, it really just felt like a, a culture in shock. It is, it is a uh, cultural culture in shock. And when you look at um, when you look at the feeding of our families, and as Gabriel is saying, the hunter goes out and he shares his food with the community who cannot afford even to eat that day. It is so important that your audience, Canadians and the rest of the world, understand that this supposed exemption is not working. We are having to learn to survive in the contemporary world, and we are trying very hard to keep alive the last remaining hunting culture. We embrace both. We should be allowed to, like the rest of the world, to take part in a modern economy. However, we are the only, Canada is the only northern country that does not have a university in the Arctic. We mm. have a high dropout rate. We, Canada just does not prioritize the education of Inuit to be able to survive in a modern context, but also to be able to survive in a traditional context. So Althea, if it you, is, if you wanted to stay in Nunavut, what kind of jobs would be available to you? Well, well that's exactly what truck, our struggle is at the, at the time. If you've ever actually visited the North, I, which I know you have, Josh, but that commenter who said that <laughs> we're not willing to adapt obviously hasn't, you know, you'd have not survived for thousands of years in the Arctic by not being willing to adapt. Mm. If, you, if he had ever been there, he would look around and know that we cannot farm, that we cannot manufacture um, goods to be sold at a competitive prices on the world market. Our options are... Um, our intellectual property, and we already maximize our opportunities there through the arts and crafts industry and the film industry. Uh, seal skins, which we're desperately trying to keep alive, and uh, the, the destructive resource extraction industries. Those are our options. And it is our hunters who are on the land, who know where the whale calving grounds are, who know the caribou migration routes, uh, who know where uh, the walrus calving grounds are, and they're the ones who are standing up to these massive mines, who some of which are owned by European uh, countries, uh, who are coming in and trying to bring in these destructive industries. It is our hunters who are saying, no, you need to reconsider this transportation route. No, you need to reconsider putting a coal mine in the most environmentally sensitive region in the world. Uh, it's our hunters that are the guardians of our land, and the, the realities of our options are harsh. And I think the, the rest of the world just needs to learn a little bit more about that. Well, thanks, Althea. And, and we're going to end it there. Thanks to all my guests, Ayu, Gabriel, Alethea, and Jack. Thanks, Malika, hanging out. All right, on the next show, we turn to Turkey, where, despite major corruption allegations and anti-government protests, the ruling AKP party came out a winner in local elections. We're going to discuss how that happened and what it means for upcoming presidential elections. Until then, we'll see you online.